Good morning, commissioners. This is the public hearing of January 6th, 2015. Chair Srinivasan. Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Here. Commissioner Bland. Commissioner Chapin. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Here. Commissioner Gustafson. Here. Commissioner Moore. Commissioner Washington. Commissioners, we're going to start with item number one, which is an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, 70 Willow Street in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District, docket number 165466, block 224, lot 16. Uh, Greek Revival style residence constructed in 1839. Application is to replace front doors and ironwork, remove sills, strip paint, alter the side and rear facades, excavate the rear yard, install a shed pool and paving. Enlarging all the cellar and second story window openings in height by dropping the sills, 
and replacing a wood porch <coughs> deck and stairs with a new rounded iron porch for the second story deck, yes. installing new louvered wood shutters at the first and third story window and door openings. And then there is, uh, okay, this is good. There's proposed excavation at the sub cellar, uh, about four feet to match, uh, to add, add floor space in the sub cellar, uh, as well as dropping the existing sub cellar floor. And then in the rear yard, excavating about 10 feet, as you can see here, um, to create an extension of the rear yard areaway right here, and to create a sunken garden and a pool. And then going to a plan now. Be, here we go. Okay. And then in the rear yard, there's a proposal to construct a brick wall around the yard, around the perimeter of the yard, and extending from the rear corner of the house here down toward the south border and then around the pool. That's that. Those are the highlights. Now I'll introduce Patrick Tacomi, who's here as a consultant, and then Dick Torres will speak to you. Can you go back to these? You can. You can go back. It's just quicker. Two more minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick W. Ciccone. I'm a preservationist and a co-author with the late Charles Lockwood of Bricks and Brownstone, which is the classic history of the New York townhouse, serving as a con historic consultant on this project to lead the presentation, along with the designers, Dick Boris and James Sheeran, along with Valerie Campbell of, uh, uh, to the right, and the owner of the house, Christina Hauser, is also present here. The presentation is divided into three sections. We'll try to move through it quickly. The first is just a summary of the, of the history that we've already seen. The second is a presentation of the design in detail. And then finally at the end, I'm going to uh, present by Dick. Finally at the end, I'm going to return to speak on the appropriateness of the proposed design. 70 Willow Street, shown in the center image, is three-story, four-bay, 40-foot wide roof revival house located on 50 by 100-foot lot between Orange and Pineapple Street in Brooklyn Heights. Detailed block plan is included in, in the uh, in your book, please note that 70 Willow Street is the bolded rectangle here, and we'll move to the 1855 Harris map of Brooklyn, which is the first fire insurance map, um, the first map where the house appears and where the story begins. This is the house right here. 70 Willow Street was completed in 1839. The date is from Clay Lancaster's on Brooklyn Heights, and built for Adrian Van Sender, a prominent member of Brooklyn's, one of Brooklyn's colonial Dutch families and a major figure in the financial and architectural development of Brooklyn in the 1820s and 1830s. Van Sender, according to one 19th century history of Brooklyn, was one of the first in the city to create buildings of, quote, higher architectural pretensions and beauty that gave Brooklyn a more elegant and credible appearance. Van Sender built a wooden house with a stable in 1828, which is visible here, and a decade later built the brick 70 Willow Street here, which is shown as 58 Willow Street in the map. That's 1839. No information survives about the architect or the master builder who designed or constructed the house. However, given the large site and lack of neighbors, along with Van Sinderen's wealth and social prominence, it's safe to assume that the house was not a speculatively built uh, development, uh, sorry, a speculatively, speculatively built house, but a unique one-off design. But it must be emphasized that the unique design of the era was nevertheless composed of classical elements whose forms were copied dire nearly directly from pattern books or, or or composed of stock or architectural elements from Manhattan suppliers, including ironwork and mantis. We'll come back to this in the design section. And also, please note that there's no wooden porch visible at the rear of the house, as there is here on the, on the frame house. This condition is also, let's see, clicker. There's also no wooden porch shown in the 1898 Hyde Atlas. And the, you can see that the yellow indicates rear wooden tea porches on the rest of the house. So this shows that there was no porch on the rear of the house throughout the 19th century. The first indication of a uh, porch on the rear of the house is in the 1904 Sanborn, indicated by this dotted line as a one-story structure. It takes various forms through the 20th century, including a uh, two-story, uh, a, a two-bay wide two-story section here. And it's currently, the current porch is a one-story porch that was an in-kind replacement of the deteriorated wooden porch things from the last several years. And also note on the, the last Sanborn that this uh, stair tower was present from 1929 and later demolished in 1994. Uh, 
circa 1994. Now, the earliest known photograph of the house is from 1902, which is about 63 years after its completion and after several exterior alterations. You'll note that the Greek Revival doors have been replaced the, with Argentina doors, more clearly visible on the 1922 photograph at right here. The original stoop railings, new ironwork, and fence have also been replaced, though the original brownstone um, stoop pedestals were retained here. Also note the bracketed window shelves on the parlor floor and the one over one windows with rectilinear tracer. It's hard to see up there, but you can see it more clearly in the book. Uh, the house, these the house was purchased in 1886 and owned by the same owner for the next 60 years. I think that many of these changes occurred in that around then, but it's, it's not quite clear of the date. Uh, but what should be noted and we'll return to is that this was sort of a piecemeal adaptation, not a wholesale rethinking of the house. The house retains its ex uh, exterior appearance through much of the 20th century, shown on the left in the famous Bernice Abbott photograph, and then on right in 1954, one year after noted uh, Broadway set designer Oliver Smith purchased the house. You'll note that the uh, windows at the top have been lengthened uh, in the entablature, and the um, divided light windows have replaced the one over ones. The house appears largely the same in 65 and 78, and now we come to the present day view of the house we've seen. Uh, to the left of the three-story row of a ton of brownstones, to the right is the 11-story Jehovah's Witness Tower. The current yellow finish dates from around 1995 when the LPC uh, issued a permit to repaint the house. The owner at the time stripped the majority of the existing finish, leaving only a single layer of contemporary paint on most of the elevations of the house. And as Catherine mentioned, the uh, house is also visible from Pineapple Street, though barely. You can see the side elevation. And even more obscurely from Columbia Heights, which is the west elevation or rear of the house here. With that, I'll turn it over to Dick to present the proposed design, and then I'm going to speak briefly at the end about the appropriateness. Hello, uh, my name is Dick Boris, and I'm the architect of record for the project. Uh, the additional members of the design team are my partner, James Sharon, Robert Silman Associates, uh, Structural Engineers, GZA, Geo, Geo Environmental, Geotechnical Engineers, and Quincy Hammond. I will now present the uh, architect architectural scope of our project. Our, um, our design intent is to restore the existing Greek Revival details of the exterior, replace stylistically inconsistent later changes with carry appropriate Greek Revival elements, and a classically inspired rear porch unifying the three visible and contiguous elevations. The next series of images you will be shown a side-by-side -side existing and proposed design for the east, south, and west elevations, photographic design inspirations, photos of the existing conditions, our designs for the restored and new elements, and concluding with the rendering of the proposed elevation, which will also be shown on boards at the end of, of the presentation. Uh, here you'll see the existing proposed east or front elevation of the house facing Willow Street. Uh, we intend to restore the following elements. Uh, the original wooden entablature, the face brick by removing the late 20th century paint, the mostly intact brownstone door surround here, through refining uh, existing profiles, uh, molding profiles, the rusticated stone base, and lastly, hinged wooden shutters with rabbited edges and operable louvers will be reintroduced re uh, here and on the remaining two elevations of the house. We propose a removal of the, uh, of, of the following later additions. The Italianate French doors, or uh, Italianate French doors and transom here. They're not arch doors, actually. There's a round transom above them. Um, replaced by a single panel front door side lacing transom here. The late 19th century ironwork, shown here, and the first floor window ledges, seen here. <coughs> here we're looking at a high resolution photograph from 1922, which shows original Greek Revival elements um, that have been subsequently uh, altered but remain fairly intact. Through our research, we found that these elements correspond almost verbatim to designs found in the 1833 Menard de Fever pattern book, The Modern Builder's Guide. Uh, in this series of images, you'll see the existing condition of the entablature on the left, uh, the detail from the 1922 photograph here, and then our design proposal for the entablature restoration at the right here. These images show the existing condition of the entablature. Paint analysis reveals that the first paint layer found in the wood is a dark reddish brown, quote, sanded paint, 
considered the original finish by the paint conservator, Jablonski. It was a common practice in the mid 19th century to finish wood elements to emulate stone, thus the sanded, sand added to the paint. Uh, note the dikes molding number 204 here, and uh, the handrail here, added uh, somewhere in the 1990s, we assume, uh, clearly uns unsuccessful DYI uh, restoration of the entablature. Uh, and here you see the photo of the existing entry door and ironwork on the left, and a proposed design on the right. The preponderance of uh, existing Greek Revival elements and proportions on the facade of the house, and the house as a whole, actually, warrants a removal of the three physically intact, yet, in, in our opinion, unsympathetic later additions, seen here. <clears throat> Meaning, we'll remove the late 19th century ironwork and Italian doors, and window ledges, and replace them with appropriate Greek Revival ironwork, entry door assembly, and simple Greek Revival brownstone window sills. Please note that the owner will salvage and make these elements available for donation. They will not be destroyed. Here you see the refined door surround. Here we worked on those moldings. Uh, and the sidelight uh, single panel entry door, the sidelight and transom, the cast iron torsier newels here, uh, tapered door pedestals here, which are remaining and intact, and the Anthemian crested fence with the Greek key skirting here. <coughs> these are the existing proposed front door section. Uh, we can review these later if you'd like, but they're in your booklet for your um, to review. And these photos show our front door side lighting transit inspirations. They are Greek Revival details found in existing New York City landmark buildings from the first half of the 19th century. They reflect the era's strict adherence to the pattern books of their time. And here <coughs> on the right uh, is our proposed ironwork at the front stoop, which is inspired by the torsier newels found here. Oops, found here at 416 West 20th Street, or Cushman Row, shown here on the left, <coughs> uh, circa 1839, the same year the Van Sinderen House was built. We've engaged Allen Architectural Metals to cast and reproduce these for us. <coughs> we feel comfortable proposing this to a shared design for our Doric stoop pedestals due to the prevalence of this type of decorative metal that once existed here in New York City. Uh, here you'll see this element here, here, and then again here, is the exact same piece. Um, which, uh, which shows that obviously the catalogs we used for this um, metal selection. These are the uh, early 20th century for our photos of surviving Greek Revival ironwork in townhouses, sadly, uh, most, most of which is lost except here in the upper right in the Cushman Road townhouse. Our, our proposed fence design employs a common theme found in many Greek Revival townhouses. Uh, for example, you'll find a 1934 half drawing on the left at 8 Washington Square North. And our fence proposal here on the right, which is a rough reduction of the existing ironwork again found on Cushman Road. <clears throat> These are the exist existing condition photos of the front areaway. On the left, you see uh, the detail of the first floor Italianate um, window ledges. These were added in the late 19th century and are not an original Greek Revival feature. The existing Greek Revival door and side lights here, which we restored, and the uh, existing window grills here on the right which are to remain as well. We will restore the picked and banded rust oh, rustication here. You can see the blow up from the 1922 photograph. You see the banding here. And uh, here is our proposal on the right. <clears throat> we are replacing the non-historical metal driveway gate with a new wooden gate painted black to match the new shutter. <clears throat> here are sections of the existing proposed double hung windows, which will be finalized at staff level. Finally, a colored rendering of the entire front elevation showing the components just presented. <clears throat> we will paint the entablature here uh, to match the color found in the first paint layer. Uh, see how the harmony and balance is returned to the facade by restoring the Greek Revival elements, their color, and their finishes. These are the existing and proposed side or south elevations of the house, the existing brick and window openings here and here. We'll receive new shutters that will be shown in the closed position. Note that we will be removing the later brick boiler chimney uh, here, in addition, in the, we don't know when we're the turn of the century, <coughs> um, uh, further allowing the brick gable end to return to its original beauty and symmetry, as you see here. Sorry. Uh, here are the photos showing the existing conditions of the side of the house, here on the right. And um, you'll see the boiler can be added later here. And actually, there are only two windows here at the bottom that we um, propose to cover up. And finally, we re 
reach the, oh, and here is the uh, rendering of the proposed design on the south elevation. <clears throat> and finally, we reach the rear or west elevation of the house. Our, our primary concern here is to create function and circulation uh, to and from the driveway, kitchen, and rear yard. The proposed solution is a classically inspired two-level semicircular cast iron porch here, uh, and flanking stairways coming down here. Um, that will lead down from the first floor to a paved terrace here at the cellar level. The design entails the removal of the existing wooden porch and deck, lengthening its second floor windows here, and bringing the rusticated base around from the facade to this level as the west cellar wall will now be fully exposed. <clears throat> These are uh, the existing wooden porch in the rear of the house, dating from 2011, when it was replaced in kind uh, a dilapidated version of the porch which in various guises was present uh, from the turn of the 20th century. We will replace the, paper, the tar paper sheathing at the attic story here um, with horizontal matchwood boards painted black and the existing leaking skylight here uh, on the right will be replaced by a slightly larger round skylight with a lower profile. <clears throat> These are the second floor window openings that will be lowered and replaced with Greek Revival French doors with transoms. Again, at the Lefebvre, we're not widening the opening, just lowering the second floor opening. And you can also already see that one of the openings has been lowered here, here again, here in detail <coughs> on the right. These are the three images of existing conditions of the cellar, at the cellar level areaway in the rear of the house. And here's a rendering here. Uh, these are three, uh, oh, these are uh, neoclassical porch designs that we use as a, as a um, basis for our design. Um, here, they're, this is in New York City. Here, contemporary, and this is obviously, for those who know, Gramercy Park on the west side of the park. <clears throat> and here's a rendering of our design for the west elevation, showing the new cast iron porch, the stairways, and casement windows, and French doors with transoms. This perspective sketch uh, illustrates the shape and configuration of the two level porch, the two stairways that lead down from the first floor, the kitchen and dining room, to the lower level. This is the east-west section of the house looking south. Again, as Catherine pointed out, this is the area of excavation here. Note on this, this excavation of 10 feet will be backfilled, as you'll see in the next slide, with planting. As you see here. And here are the sections of the new brick wall at various locations around the perimeter of the rear yard. You can review this later if you'd like. And now images 41 through 49 <coughs> show the existing and proposed floor plans. I'll go through these quite quickly. Here are the existing subcellar. This portion of the subcellar is not yet excavated. We propose that to be um, excavated along with the rest of the subcellar. Existing cellar plan here, the area way in the back. The proposed cellar plan, widening the area in the back, and um, the two levels of garden and this new uh, garden repeating here. The existing first floor plan here, the porch to be removed. The proposed first floor plan again, you can see in plan our idea for the porch and flanking stairs. Second floor plan, <coughs> porch here, the deck, new proposal here. Third floor, attic, a roof plan. <coughs> uh, and now I'm reading to Patrick Tony with a closing statement about the historical program. Brooklyn Heights was the first New York City Historic District designated in 1965, 50 years ago. The designation report, as you know, identifies the qualities of the entire district without containing the detailed architectural histories by property of later districts. Indeed, the Brooklyn Heights Historic designation was a test case for the new Landmarks Law of regulating an entire district composed not of individual monuments. These are the words of Otis Pratt Pearsall, but instead of dense group, quote, dense groupings of homogenous structures which retain in high degree the integrity of their original architecture, which together form a collective emanation, end quote, a quality that distinguishes historic districts from landmarks. This quality has led the Landmarks Commission to favor the preservation of 19th century and early 20th century alterations to residential buildings, since the Brooklyn Heights Historic District is correctly viewed as an accumulation of changes over time whose character as a whole stems from this architectural layer. 
Yet even within a diverse historic district like Portland Heights, there are especially significant buildings that would merit consideration and designation as standalone monuments. The Van Sinderen House at 70 Willow Street is one such building. And its individual significance as a rare four-bay-wide Greek Revival mansion should be considered foremost when weighing the appropriateness of the changes before it. The Van Sinderen House was completed in 1839. Was, one, was among the handful of early 19th century New York houses whose owners could afford the grandeur of a house that was almost twice the, the width of a typical row house, here 40 feet wide on a 50 foot wide lot, and four bays wide rather than the typical three bays. The set of surviving, individually commissioned large houses from this era left standing across the city is vanishingly small. And the Van Sinderen House at 70 Willow Street is one of the few such mansions built during the Greek Revival era that, barring a handful of changes over time, survives recognizably intact today. There are two other surviving brick-funded four-bay houses in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District shown in the slide, 70, Will uh, 70 Hicks Street at center and 90 State Street on the right. These houses, as rare as they are, illustrate the extremely distinguished nature of 70 Willow Street by comparison. 170 Hicks Street, though recognizable at the base as, a Greek revival, as Greek revival in style, later gained two additional stories in the reimagining of the house a large flat building. It's up here, this giant later cornice. 90 State Street, though largely intact, blends into a row of similar, though narrow and squatter Greek Revival Atene uh, houses to the left and right, which are sort of visible here. By contrast, 70 Willow Street, as the fire insurance map we saw earlier makes clear, was cited to three elevations were visible, not just the Willow Street elevation alone, making it legible as a nearly freestanding house, the quality it retains today especially with its gabled roof profile and, and flanking chimneys, which sort of disappear into the background. The chimneys are right there. Indeed, this new freestanding quality is highlighted by the destruction of the neighboring 19th century houses immediately to the north. Though the 11th story residential tower to the right dwarfs 70 Willow Street, there's a small hyphen of empty space, visible here, that serves to highlight the house as a standalone composition. The house's true peers among four bay wide Greek revival mansions are not in Brooklyn Heights, however but in Manhattan, both on, located on West 22nd Street in the Chelsea Historic District. There are the Edwin Forest House on the left, 436 West 22nd Street, built in 1835, and here captured in Habs documentation from the 30s, and later sadly mutilated, and the Tucker House at 337 West 22nd Street, constructed in 1836 at the right. The Forest House, apart from the early 20th century balconies and French windows at the top, gives an idea of the elegant and austere simplicity of the four bay wide Greek revival design, including intact door, door, and ironwork at the base, readable as a unified composition. The Tucker House, by contrast, has been transformed into an Italian mansion in such a comprehensive fashion that its original Greek revival identity has been effectively obscured. Here would be clearly inappropriate to reverse these alterations because the house's significance lies in this very transformation. This is not the case at 70 Willow Street, where the house's Greek revival character remains largely intact, and where the later alterations on the primary elevations, specifically the door, the ironwork, and the projecting shelves beneath the parlor floor windows, can be read as less than sympathetic alterations to the Greek revival fabric. Though these alterations occurred in the late 19th century and might charitably be forgiven as contributing to the accretion of character to the house over time, they are nevertheless jarring since the rest of the Greek revival elements remain present, even if masked by paint and other minor changes. And unlike a row of speculative, speculatively built row houses, where one can read the changes to the original houses, identical original houses, and the variety of transformations on constituent members of the row, 70 Willow Street has no such immediate context. Though this renovation is largely an aesthetic decision, not a materials one, it should be emphasized that the balance of the proposed work is the restoration of existing fabric, not alterations. Moreover, the proposed alterations to restore the integrity of the Greek Revival character of the house are all based on the solid documentation of either extant Greek Revival townhouses in New York, early 20th century photographs of New York townhouses that have since been demolished, and the 1830s patterns book of New York architect Minority Lefevre mentioned earlier, and in the book, there's some side-by-side -side, uh, pictures of the builder's guide and the existing entablature. These sources point to the special nature of the house in the context of the era's architecture, as I mentioned in the history. Though the evidence suggests that the house was commissioned individually by Adrian Van Sinderen, its design was nevertheless composed from familiar and repeated stock elements. 
Thus, it is logical and appropriate to design the door and ironwork based on these examples. They were and are, in rare surviving examples, found on Greek revival houses in effectively identical forms across the city. The design for the rear of the house, by contrast, is a modern classical design based on historic precedents. It's not a conjectural period design, as the house never had a porch in the 19th century, but instead to give the rear of the house functional and aesthetic coherence in the most simple man manner possible. This speaks to the design as a whole, both outside and inside. <coughs> Though historic district interiors are not under the purview of the Landmarks Commission, we know that too many buildings in historic districts across the city are viewed by owners as protective facades, inside of which sits the tabo tabula rasa of an empty box. The Greek revival renovation of 70 Royal Street takes decidedly the opposite approach, one which ties together the intact Greek revival details of the interior with the exterior design proposed before you today. The design taken as a whole is thus completely appropriate given the clear historic significance of the Van Sinderen's house's Greek revival design and ex extreme rarity as a four bay individually commissioned house for this era. And finally, to return to the words of the 1965 Brooklyn Heights designation report, also by Otis Pratt Pierce, uh, written by Otis Pratt Pearsall, or the, these words are, are from Otis Pratt Pearsall. The Brooklyn Heights Historic District, quote, eminent, quote, emanates an appearance and even more a spirit and character of old New York. This renovation will pr preserve and enhance this, this spirit and character, both for the house and the entire Brooklyn Heights Historic District. And with that, turn it over to questions. Should note that have the endorsement letters been distributed. Yeah. So before you also have, beside the book, there are three letters of endorsement. One is from Pi Gardner, the executive director of the Merchants House Museum. Second is from Thomas Gordon Smith, the dean of University of Notre Dame Architecture Architecture School. And the final, somewhat more sentimental one, is from the fifth great son, great grandson, or great 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 great, I think, grandson of the original builder of the house. So. With that, turn it over to questions. Thank you. Are there questions for the applicant? Yes, uh, Michael. The intent is to, I mean, you're not restoring the architectural integrity, you're replicating the architectural integrity. If the intent is to recreate a Greek revival facade, why are the freeze windows uh, remaining the anomaly? I just also the children's bedrooms the client house obviously wants them to have windows they can see out of it um the flooding air. All right, uh, other questions, Roberta? Well in, in terms of the door and the front of the building, is it are you saying that you were changing you understand that it's not a, it wasn't original and so therefore you think that you you're changing it to something better than what is there now? Is that your Yes, more or less but it, we're we're basing it on expand there's no conjecture here what a Greek Revival door 83 is going to look like. We're basing it on extant examples. They're actually, the exact same door <coughs> occurs around the street on Cranberry Street. Um, that was, a, that was a, 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 a choice that we made, so we, there was no conjecture. We, we wanted to replicate things that we knew that existed in 1839 in New York City. Okay, but now we just talked about the windows at the top. Mm -hmm. Which, which is the building code and outlet. Right, right, right. But I'm saying, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think that the doors and the front of the building, I mean, the entrance, the, the metal work that's there, um, it could be argued is more appropriate, um, even though it's not the original, but it's more appropriate because it is, it does have some time having been there. And that it, we can't really prove that the other door is, I don't know how you can prove that it's a better door in terms of aesthetics or in terms of history mm -hmm. than this door. Therein lies the rub. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the thing, we, we actually stepped back from this house thinking we'd, we'd originally save those parts. You step back and realize this is, this is a freestanding object. The three, there are three elements, the door, the window ledges, and the ironwork that keep it from being completely besides those windows and this weird addition at the top, which again, we cannot take out because it's the room. Um, it, it's just a missed opportunity in our eyes. There, there were no other in the city. The one that you use in the LPC book, the Cushman Rowhouse, is barely holding on. Um, the, 
those scepters, there used to be two more scepters, maybe five years ago they're gone. They've never been replaced. And we've gone by the house and there's bits and pieces of the fence gone, and <clears throat> so forth, no shutters. So we're, we're kind of screaming for this to be uh, allowed to go back. There's nothing else in the city that exists. Are shutters consistent with Greek revival? There are pencils on the back. They're and on the front. And the, no, the whole house, they're on the, the photographs. Hinges and pencils and uh, in the original, and many Greek revival houses did have them. So we have the forensic example that we had them here. Um, and it was kind of a personal choice. Some, some houses had or and didn't they, have. Or, and they appeared and disappeared over time. I think they're probably stored in the basement or whatever and put back on it all. Right. That's why you see them sometimes closed, sometimes not. But, but, but are they consistent with Greek revival? So oh, I'm yeah, asking. Yes, 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 are they? Yes. Okay. They were yep. taken off their yep. front because of the window like yep. I said earlier. They probably yep. had balustrades around them. They were taken off because they couldn't close. Yeah, there, okay. there are uh, pencils here for the shutters. And when these window, uh, 19th century Italian window ledges went in, the shutters were taken off because actually the window ledges once had balustrades on them. So it's, mm. it's a domino effect. Mm -hmm. Every, you know, the, the more you, you know, take off, the more you have to take off. And then certain things come in that actually make the other things harder to, to go back to. So it ends up in this half, half, halfway. Mm -hmm. other, yes, One Michael. More on that same line, or it, it, you, you made a choice to change, to keep the windows in the, the gridded uh, design as opposed to one that seems to be supported by the historic photos of the one over one with the, I forget the Trace. word you used. Oh. Uh, well, kind of clean hand. Yeah, kind of your, 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 your feeling is that those were not original and that those were, uh, uh, yeah, they were almost certainly changed late 19th century. But this is, this is, again, we're, not to reiterate the same point over and over, is that respect the idea that for many, if not the majority of cases from the historic district, that the accretion of changes over time is something to be preserved. In this case, the, the special significance of the house, both within the district, but really in the context of surviving historic um, houses in New York City, makes a slightly different case, especially because the transformation wasn't wholesale, as you saw with with the, uh, the Tucker House in the district, that these were sort of, in some ways, uh, they, they weren't, they, they changed the character, but not overwhelmingly. And in some cases, you know, was, you know they did not change the, the cornice, as many other houses do, or even the windows windows around and stuff like that. We're, we're, we're glad that the um, buttons are kind of lazy, actually. Um, they didn't do the whole house. So. Okay, thank you. And other, yes, Roberta. It's already at that level. Pushing yeah. out of it. It's already existing. We're just pushing it out. Yeah. And then the, there's a lawn here, the terrace here, and then the driveway. So, so, <coughs> so what's at the, at the back of the yard? Well, the, rem the rest of the garden has been lowered at various levels. But yeah, right adjacent to the house, the level was already there. We've just yeah, this pushed level it existed. We extended it to here, five steps up to the lawn, the planting. Uh, But, but what is the uh, the existing grade on? Where is that? No, I mean the the regular uh, yard. It was in three or four different levels. It was about here. Okay. 
So you said in the earlier picture that this is going to be excavated by 10 feet, but it's not actually being excavated, is it? It's being excavated to build back up to provide planting. Oh, sorry. Oh. We're taking it down to build it back up, to give it a base. I see, but, but that's all earth, and it's not, there's no, there's no space under it. No, no, it's no, a good space. Okay. Back and forth shows it clearly. Yeah, so. it's, it, there's no space under there. It's all backfilled. I see. With um, soil and so forth. Okay. Uh, yes, Michael? I'm not going to let you off on the roof. I can't recall any 19th century membrane roofs. Um, we, we, what's the deal? <laughs> uh, uh, no, uh, we, we've gone back and forth on that. We, we actually were thinking about doing a, a later proposal to do a standing tin roof. How about uh, slate? We don't, or possibly... One of the maps um, says, the, the cliche shows it's either slate or, or copper. Um, it could be either. I think I'd rather go with copper because of the slope is very low. Um, I'd do a standing stain metal roof. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for now? Uh, just one yes. one question. Yeah. The the current the existing door and the and the ironwork that's existing right now those are in good condition, bad condition. Um, some of the railing is rotted as it meets the house and the portions of the fence here. Um, the door has been sandblasted, unfortunately. The, the paint analysis found deep impregnations of sand. The, the carving, you know, is fairly three dimensional, so it survived, but it was really kind of worn down. And, and you said about the um, that the building was originally painted in the 1800 in the late 1800s. So, it, 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 so it was on the paint analysis shows a thick accumulation of dirt before the first, before the first coat, indicating that it was unpainted. And this is the typical exterior finish of a Greek Revival house, which we haven't shown the detail, but it's, it is uh, very plain or with very tight mortar lines. In all likelihood, the, the original house was unpainted. The first layer of the paint is from probably the 1880s when there's a, a Brooklyn Eagle article calling it a white brick house. The first coat in the paint analysis uh, was a lime wash. So we think that that's when it was painted white. And then at some point, though it's hard to tell color from black and white photographs, that the yellow is from the early 20th century. Is it pressed brick with uh, pencil joints? Yes. Yeah. So in the end, it will be, there, there won't be paint. Yeah. Yeah. Right. A beautiful, classic, you know, Greek revival, ready orange brick house with the tight lines. But you add it stucco somewhere. Stucco, no, well, oh, they were restoring a rusticated base, which today is just, you know, smooth plaster like the walls here with a pencil mark. The original stucco was uh, actually nicer than most. The original brownstone banded and what's called picked, almost like pock marks and then banding. It was quite luxurious. Um, and that we, we saw in the 1923 era. So That's what you're bringing yeah. back. Yeah. And I was just asked to um, clarify the levels in the backyard. Sorry. Um, here, the excavation, the, the existing backyard here, the new backyard is actually lower, about three and a half feet lower, average of three and a half feet lower than the existing um, to, the, to the west at Columbia Heights. There are two properties back there. There's actually 111 Columbia Street. Um, street is excavating as well, and they're actually matching our height. They'll be the same height on both sides of that, that wall at 111 Columbia. So half the property will be equal, and then the, the north half of the property will be equal. Uh, can you just show us that in plan? Because I know your plan shows various levels. And, and Commissioners, that's actually coming right for the public hearing yeah, soon. It hasn't been approved so yet. This is, this is the that's problem. coming forward to public hearing soon, in, probably next month. I'm sorry. The, 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 the reference that you're making to an adjacent house oh, yeah. oh, okay. hasn't come to you yet. So that, that's this property okay, here. That property for this amount of space will be exactly equal. Here over, portion of 111, then the next property to the, the north. This is about three feet lower than this creek. So what is the elevation of the, the largest part of the rear yard versus uh, the edge part? We, we don't have it. Here we do. Yes. We do. No, I mean like even minus five feet, three feet here we go. versus two feet. AA is to the, the north, the, uh, the Jehovah's Witness building. Um, DB is here. That's the, the biggest um, difference here. CC, we're showing the existing and then the proposed down here for this portion here. DD is this, again this amount, and then EE -E is slightly lower. So, what uh, is lowest is four feet six, is that right? Yeah. 
Okay, so it's somewhere between two feet and four feet six. So the existing on that drawing is your yard, or is it the neighbor's yard? The existing is the neighbor. Oh, so many bullets to the left, maybe 20 seconds. Okay. okay. Thank you. We'll take testimony. Should we put up the board? Oh, yeah. Sure. Christabel Guff. Christabel? Yes. Okay. Christabel Goff for the Society for the Architecture okay. of the City. If this were, in fact, a clear restoration, it would not be here. It would have been handled at staff level. It is hard to understand, for me at least, why anyone would feel the need to strip the front of the house of its historic ironwork and replace it with copies of different ironwork from a variety of alien sources in Manhattan. Why must real Brooklyn go into the dumpster, although we now hear it's going to be saved and given away, uh, to make way for copies of Chelsea and Hab's drawings of Washington Square? And given this concern for documenting the authenticity of these misplaced choices, the explanation of precedents for those totally bizarre colonnettes and gratings proposed for the new ironwork back porch, I do not see anything similar in Gramercy. I don't, I don't know what they're talking about with that. Uh, is it really necessary to trash the charming front door and its surrounds because it was done a little later than the first period of the house? and strip off the domestically useful ledges for window boxes. This is a lived-in old house with a long history, turning into an academic exercise in stylistic purity, but it is a textbook kind of purity with no heart. It is also a matter for grant that the 50s apparently are regarded as cat's meat here. The removal of the porch in the materials available last Wednesday was justified by dating it to 1950. We are now hearing that it was rebuilt again. Obviously, it is not the same shabby wisteria draped porch where Oliver Smith and Truman Capote drank their martinis. Smith moved to Brooklyn to live at the famous mid Street rooming house with W.H. Auden, Carson McCullers, Jane and Paul Bowles, Richard Wright, Benjamin Britten, Gypsy Rose Lee and others. Then he moved around the corner to this house where he spent his life restoring while designing Broadway sets for West Side Story and My Fair Lady and ballet sets for Agnes DeMille and Leonid Massim. Truman Capote's basement apartment is to be demolished in the excavation. Sick transit. Brooklyn Heights did have an intellectual life at one time. Thank you. Um, Judy Stanton. 